tuning in. Um, may God's word richly bless you. Make sure you subscribe, uh, share this video with a friend or family member, and I pray that God's word will enrich you, that God's word will give you peace, that the Lord will give you strength. Please join me for prayer. Heavenly Lord, we uh, thank you for this day. We thank you for these moments of quiet, that we can turn our hearts towards you, and that we can, we can worship, and that we can hear your word that we can receive your affirming, uh, affirming words of peace. Lord, we ask that you will speak to us and we invite your Holy Spirit to be in our space, that we would acknowledge you and that we would be strengthened. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please join me for confession and absolution. Almighty God, who sent the promised Holy Spirit to fill disciples with willing faith, we confess that we resist the work of your Spirit among us, that we are slow to serve you and reluctant to spread the good news of your love. God, have mercy on us, forgive our divisions, and by your Spirit draw us together. Create in us a desire to do your will and be your faithful people for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4 beginning with the first verse. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. 
follow them, so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. Who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them, the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 7. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is, with, for, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Blessings to all of you. So glad you are here. Um, thank you for tuning in uh, for these moments where we allow God's word to speak to you. Now, a couple, a couple won the state lottery of $60 million. Now, she found out first because she was... Uh, you know, she would be following the drawings and she was comparing the numbers to her ticket. And she was the first one who found out that they had won $60 million. Well, she had a problem because her husband had a, had a serious heart condition. She was afraid that if she broke the good news that it would shock him and, and give him another heart attack. And so she thought about it, what, what should she do? How is she going to break this good news to her husband who had a serious heart condition? And so finally, finally she decided to contact her pastor. And so she spoke to her pastor and explained that her husband, Joe, he had a very serious heart condition. And the fact that if he found out, he would be so shocked that he won the lottery that he might have a heart attack. And so she didn't want to risk that. And so, so the pastor goes over and, you know, and he acknowledges the problem. He goes over to the house and he begins to speak to Joe in a very tactful way, uh, knowing that he had a heart condition. He says, now Joe, now, now suppose, now, now suppose, now I'm just saying supposedly, supposedly you won the lottery. Let's say the amount of $60 million. Then he asked Joe, Joe, what would you do with all that money? Joe thought about it for a second, and he said, I would get, give half to the church. Now the pastor fainted and had a heart attack. All right. 
the human heart is is one of the most amazing creations uh, of, from our Creator God. Now, here are some facts. Um, the average adult heart beats 72 times a minute, 100,000 times a day, 3,600,000 times a year, and 2.5 billion times during a lifetime. Pretty amazing. Even though the heart weighs only 11 ounces on average, a healthy heart pumps 2,000 gallons of blood through 60,000 miles of blood vessels each day. Now this is each day, 2,000 gallons through 60,000 miles of blood vessels. Now for a kitchen faucet, it would be, the kitchen faucet would need to be turned down for 45 years to equal the amount of blood pumped by the heart in the average lifetime. So the average lifetime of how much a heart uh, pumps blood, it would take 45 years. To, if you leave the faucet on for 45 years, that would be equivalent. Every day, the heart creates enough energy to drive a truck 20 miles. In a lifetime, that is equivalent to driving to the moon and back. Because the heart has its own electrical impulses, it can beat even when separated from the body, as long as it has adequate supply of oxygen. Isn't that amazing? And finally, during an average lifetime, the heart will pump nearly 1.5 million barrels of blood, enough to fill 200 train tank cars. The heart is truly amazing. Last week, we talked about the heart, but we talked about the spiritual and moral problems with the heart. And that's what Jesus confronted the Pharisees and the scribes with. In fact, Jesus called them out, calling them hypocrites, or more accurately, actors. People who were doing things on the outside ritually, that is, following traditions to make themselves look good on the outside, but internally, their hearts were rotten. Their hearts were far away from God. They were giving God a lip service. They were putting on a show. Now, after publicly rebuking these, these people, the crowd began to disperse. But Jesus was concerned about those who were deceived by their teachings. And so Jesus calls them back, and this is where our text picks up in Mark chapter 7, verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd and said to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of the person that defiles them. What Jesus is saying is that, that eating food without being blessed or even eating food without performing to traditional rituals of hand washing, that does not contaminate the food. When the person eats the food, it does not, con well, eating food that is touched by contaminated hands does not contaminate the heart. So even if you don't do the ceremonial washings, that food will not corrupt a person's heart. So contamination comes not from the outside, but rather from the inside. But the disciples were not very sharp. They didn't understand this. And so Jesus says, after he left the crowd, entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart but into their stomach, then out of the body. Jesus was disappointed with the, their slowness of understanding. Jesus had to reiterate to them that food, food, physical food, whether it is touched by a non-believer, a Gentile, or eaten with ceremonial unwashed hands, does not make a person 
does not contaminate the person, does not make a person spiritually unclean. And so contamination comes from the inside. Finally, he, he goes on and he just, he just gets to the point and he says, verse 20, what comes out of the person is what defiles them, makes them unclean. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So what is he saying? The origins of spiritual defilement comes from the heart. The heart is the cause of being spiritually unclean. My dear friends in Christ, I think, I assume that we're all aware that the number one killer in the, in the U.S. and worldwide is heart disease. It is also the number one killer Spiritual heart disease is the number one killer of people as well. It is the reason why people refuse Christ. Jesus said, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Acts of sin originate from the heart. So number one, we have a spiritual heart problem. Let me take you back to, to ancient Germany. Now, there was a man named Adolf, Eich, Adolf Eichmann. He, was, he grew up in a Lutheran family in Germany uh, in 1906. Um, he had a few jobs, a wife, some kids. For 30 years, he lived a very ordinary life until he joined the Nazi party. And then he got promoted. Then he got promoted. And then he became the chief executioner. So during the Holocaust, he was organizing and planning and transporting Jews to execution camps. He was considered a mass murderer. Now during his trial, there were 90 witnesses who survived. And so there was this, one man who came, 90 people survived and came to testify. There's this one man named Dinor. Now, Dinor was a survivor, and when he entered the courtroom, and as he testified, he said the death camps were like planet of ashes. Then the prosecution began asking him questions, and um, he couldn't finish his testimony. He fainted and he couldn't answer. Nobody knew what happened. He fell over, he passed out. And so it wasn't until 22 years later, Mike Wallace did an interview with Denor for 60 minutes about Eichmann. So Wallace showed Denor the video clip of him giving his testimony and his collapse and asked him what happened that day. Was it fear, hatred, regret, memories? No, said Dinor. When I saw Eichmann, I realized that he was just a man, just like me. There was really no difference. I was capable of the very thing that he did. I collapsed because I saw my reflection in him. Wallace ends the interview by stating, Eichmann is in awe of us. You see, my friends, Dinur revealed a truth, all about, of truth about us. All of us are capable of unthinkable evils. The prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 17, 9, he wrote, the heart is deceitful above all things, beyond cure, who can understand it? King David wrote in Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth, 
sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We are born with an innate ability to sin, to do evil. We are all born with a sinful nature. The heart of the problem, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Let me say that again. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. King David, he had a reputation of being a man after God's own heart. Now, one season, he was supposed to be off with his men. In ancient times, kings were off fighting battles with his men on the battlefield. This one season, David decided to stay behind. He got lazy. Well, in ancient times, kings were warriors. David was a warrior king. In fact, he enjoyed camaraderie, camaraderie with his men fighting battles and winning battles. Well, this season, he got lazy, stayed behind, ended up not having any much to do, couldn't sleep, and he decided to go up on the rooftop of his palace. It was probably late in the evening. That was when he noticed and he saw a woman bathing. This was Bathsheba. This was a lust at first sight. Well, David did some research, sent his men to do some research, find out who, who she was. She was beautiful. Found out that she was Bathsheba, a, the wife of one of his loyal men who was in the battlefield. Well, David knew she was married. He didn't care. She was so beautiful that he summoned her to the palace and he committed adultery. It was then, not too long later, she sent a note to him telling him that she was pregnant. David began to cover up. And so he summoned this loyal soldier to leave the battlefield, to go home and enjoy his wife. But he did not. He refused to. And so after several summons, he didn't go home. David ordered that he be put in the front lines of the battlefield and then ordered the men to withdraw. He was killed in battle. Then he would receive, he would receive a hero's funeral. Then David would marry his widow. He would be the sympathetic king who married the widow of a fallen soldier. David would come out looking good. Why would David do something like that? A man after God's own heart. I mean, he could have had any women in his kingdom, but why did he have to choose a married woman? Friends, the heart is capable of all sorts of evil. The problem with human beings is not on the outside. It is on the inside. It is the moral we have a moral and spiritual problem with our hearts. Which leads to our second point here. We need to acknowledge our powerlessness, which means that is the first step to solving any problem, is to acknowledge the problem. Friends, you and I, we cannot cleanse our hearts spiritually from our sins. It's an internal problem, a spiritual problem. We must acknowledge that no matter what we do uh, ritually on the outside, even coming to church, it will not cleanse our heart from our sins. To illustrate this truth, we must acknowledge this problem. To illustrate this truth, Jesus told a story. And the story is about a tax collector and a Pharisee. Now the Pharisee goes to the temple and he prays, God, I thank you. I'm not like those dirty people, crooks, robbers, adulterers. I fast twice a week and I tithe. The Pharisee was bragging about the things that, the ritualistic things that he did on the outside. In contrast, there is a tax collector who, a tax collector was considered a traitor back then. Collecting taxes for the hated Romans for, from his, his own people. And so this tax collector comes before 
comes into the temple. He, stand, he stood at a distance, refuses to even look up, buries his, hand, his face in his hands, and he prays, God, give me mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. This tax collector acknowledged his helplessness before God. He acknowledged the, his problem of sin. Jesus said, this tax collector, not the other, went home, went home, made right with God. That's the same thing that happened to King David. David thought not, not, nobody would ever know what happened. Well, God knew. He sent the prophet Nathan. Nathan confronted him. And these are the words from Nathan. Why then have you despised the command of the Lord? by doing what I considered evil. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own wife. You murdered him with the Ammonite's sword. David then acknowledges, I have sinned against the Lord. The prophet responds, the Lord also has taken away your sin. David later wrote in Psalm 51, for I know my transgressions and my sins is always before you. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is right in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. You notice King David did not make any excuses. He didn't blame anyone. He owned up to his sin. He said, it is my iniquity, my sin, my transgressions. Friends, we need to acknowledge our powerlessness. We need to acknowledge our sin before God. When we do that, Romans 3, 22 to 24, God offers his son Jesus to us. Paul writes, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is saying everyone, every person has dirty hearts. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace, are made righteous, cleansed by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It had to come through Jesus, his suffering and his death and his resurrection. For this to happen, Jesus would have to suffer and die for us. It all began in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember Jesus. He was in agony over his destiny, the cross, the suffering that would come in front of him. He was sweating drops of blood, which is a which is a medical condition. He was tied to a pole and beaten with a whip, not just any whip. These Roman whips had jagged bones tied to the ends and lead, pieces of lead. Every strike on the back would tear into a person's flesh, causing deep bruising and deep cuts and bleeding. We don't know how many times they beat him, but what we do know is the Romans could care less about the Jewish tradition of 39 whips. He was forced to wear a crown of thorns and a robe. Think about it. After they put the crown of thorns upon his, his, his um, forehead, they struck his head several times, They're pushing deeper the thorns into his head. Think about the pain the hurt, the suffering. They mocked him, and they made him wear a robe, and they tore it off of him. That is like carelessly removing bandage from a wound. Jesus' back was wounded already. They tore off that robe. It was like tearing, the pain of his tearing skin. When they got him to the cross, they nailed, they nailed they put nails in his wrists and feet. For Jesus to take a breath, he would have to push up to breathe. 
Think about the agony. Think about the pain. Think about how, how much it would cost every time to take a deep breath, to inhale and exhale. Someone concluded, eventually his body shut down. Somebody concluded the verdict here is the cause of death is cardiac and respiratory arrest due to hypovolemic and traumatic shock due to crucifixion. That's what it costs for our redemption, for our, our hearts to be cleansed. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, John writes, if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge our sins, we confess it before God. He is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Purify our sins. That's what Jesus did for us, for me, for you. Finally, my last point is go tell others. That's the good news. Tell others what Jesus has done for you. Let me wrap this up here with a quick story here. In 1941, um, there was a Catholic priest named Father Maximilian Kobe. He was 47 years old at the time. He was arrested by the Nazi Germans' secret police. He was sent to a camp. He was assigned to Barrack 14. There he continued to minister to fellow prisoners who poured their hearts out to him. Oftentimes, he would make the sign of the cross over him. Then one night, in Barrack 14, one of the men escaped. Afterwards, everybody in Barrack 14 was forced to stand for an entire day in front of the hot sun. By evening, the commander wanted to make, to illustrate a point. He said, the fugitive has not been found. Ten of you would have to die in a starvation bunker, he screamed. Then ten were chosen. Then there was one man crying out, my poor children, my wife, what will they do? It was at that moment, the Catholic priest, Father Kobe, stepped out and said, look, I'm a Catholic priest. I don't have a wife and a children. He said, I want to die instead of that man. The commander, the commander accepted his offer. And so he was put in Barrack 11, a starvation bunker. And there in the past, prisoners would, would yell and scream, would fight each other. But this time it was different. There were times you would, it would sound like a church service. They would be singing praises to God. One by one, they all died as, as Kobe, as Father Kobe, Maximilian Kobe, was shepherding these men, walking with them as they faced the shadow of death. Finally, all of them died, and he was the last one, and he was given a lethal injection on August 14, 1941. The one man that he saved Francis Shizek. Francis Francis Shiz, his first name. Gaw, Gawanashek, Gawanashek was the prisoner that was released. He was spared. When he was 53 years old and all the way to his 95, he told people, he joyously told people what Father Kobe did for him. My dear friends in Christ, tell others what he did for you, that through his sacrificial death, your heart has been cleansed, your sins are forgiven. You come to worship and you worship him from your heart because of what he's done for you. He gave his life for you and so will you live for him. We have a problem. The problem is the human heart. We have a spiritual and moral problem with this human heart. We must acknowledge this problem, but we can't solve it with our own effort. Jesus did. 
through his suffering and death and his resurrection. Finally, joyfully tell others what Jesus has done for you. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God's word richly bless you. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that, that being clean is not on the inside, but rather what's on the, what's, it's not on the outside, but rather what's on the inside that matters most to you. You came, you sent your son Jesus, who died on a cross for our sins, to cleanse us from all of our sins, to purify our hearts, Lord. We thank you for that, though, the amazing grace. Help us to respond to your love. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. <clears throat>